everybody. Nice to see you, Carol. Nice to see you, Chloe Rose. We're just waiting for Dr. Amy Benstead. She's joining us in two seconds, so. Hello, Sharon, great seeing you. So it um, won't be long, so we're soon up. Ah, one second. Dr. Amy Benson's having a little trouble joining, but bear with us. Okay. So oh, just, wonderful. There we go. <laughs> I love it when it works. <laughs> oh dear. So welcome everyone and um, good evening from wherever you are or it might be good day uh, from where you're tuning in. So firstly, thank you for taking the time to join us here at Justice in Fashion. Um, really encouraging to see so many of you back with us after our last Wednesday Wisdom session. And for those of you who are new to the Justice in Fashion family, uh, my name's Erica. I'm one of the founding members and will be hosting today's session. And as a global alliance of lawyers, academics, supply chain experts, gender rights specialists, researchers, and social entrepreneurs, um, we are seeking to redistribute wealth, power, and risk in the fashion industry. So by empowering and educating and engaging with stakeholders um, in the fashion supply chain, we're endeavoring to work with those on the front line, be it investors and brands, consumers, all those vested parties within the complex chain so as to provide a voice to the voiceless. So that's us, Justice in Fashion. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce um, Amy, Dr. Amy Benstead, lecturer in fashion management at the University of Manchester. So welcome, Amy. Really great that you're here this evening. So um, we're going to be discussing um, modern slavery. Uh, and please, listeners, if you have any questions, do pop them in the comments box. Uh, so towards the end, we'll have some time to um, address them and for Amy to answer any questions that you may have. So um, yeah, without further ado, let's go into it. So Amy, you've had um, international experience in the fashion industry. And most recently, you've been a senior merchandise manager based in Istanbul where you sourced and managed production for lots of uh, major UK fashion retailers. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your industry background and how that's informed most recently, I guess, your academic research area? Yeah, so um, I've worked in industry for about seven years. So like you said, most recently, um, I was based out in Istanbul. So I worked for Liam Funk. Um, they're uh, one of the world's largest global sourcing firms. Not many people have heard from them because they kind of, they're classed as like a, a, an intermediary. So they're like the middleman um, between the retailers and the brands and the factories. Um, so they, um, the, the retailers and the brands put in order with Liam Fung and they really manage everything from design through to um, delivery. So I went out to Istanbul, set up a team so that we could manage orders for the um, UK high street retailers. So I was involved in finding the factories, um, sourcing the products, negotiating the prices, the delivery, and then the whole critical pass of the production process. Um, and then I moved back to the UK and um, decided to do a PhD at Lancaster University. Um, where I've focused on reshoring and modern slavery. So my industry background has really helped. I mean, I, I hold my hands up because I've been on that side. You know, I've put factories under pressure to meet lead time and price requirements. Um, at the same time, as part of my job, I needed to make sure they passed their audits that the retailers needed. So I've had that experience of working with factories through the, um, the audit process as well. Um, and then I've worked at the University of Manchester for the past three years now. So 
my research really focuses on global sourcing, um, social sustainability, and particularly modern slavery. Um, it's because the modern slavery legislation in the UK came out during my PhD, so that was a real focus of my research then. Oh, great. Wow. So I feel today oh, is going to be a good discussion or a definitely a good insight into what really happens. Um, so one of the things, so you've mentioned obviously modern slavery, and one of the things when we think about sustainability, which is a little bit of a I guess, a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but we think about the environment, uh, which of course is important. Um, but when, when we read things like the International Labour Organization, uh, where they estimate roughly over, I guess, 16 million people are victims of economic, economic forced labour. And then when we hear that the textile and fashion industry is by far one of the most um, or largest perpetrators um, in both developing and um, developed countries. Uh, in terms of your experience, what's been some of the main challenges that you've seen over the years regarding modern slavery? I think it's just the, the complexity. Um, you know, the, the fashion industry is made up of you know, global supply chains. And like you said, it's, it's happening all over the world. So, um, there's a lot of overlapping supply chains um it's a very labor intensive industry as well um and it's really difficult to 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 investigate you know it's a it's a criminal industry. so um that a few countries have started to introduce modern slavery legislation and that that is helping i mean there's obviously weaknesses with the legislation but you've got to start somewhere and that is you know it's encouraging companies to investigate what's happening within them, within their supply chain and and encouraging them to be more responsible and take that accountability yeah yeah absolutely and i guess um one of the pressing questions is um you know since I guess, COVID, have there been any particular um, challenges that have really heightened um, or come to a forefront? I think COVID has really shown the fragility of um, like global complex supply chains. And it's really unearthed some of the issues that were already there. So you know, the overproduction, for example, and we've seen the, the devastating effects of that, how so many retailers and, and brands have, have actually, you know, they've suffered, but they've cancelled their orders. Um, it's been a, a lot in the in the media. Bangladesh, for example, is a country that has, has suffered in particular. Um, retailers and brands, you know, they had their stock already made in the factory at the port and they've cancelled those orders. So the suppliers aren't getting paid and ultimately it's the workers that suffer. And these workers, you know, aren't paid that much anyway. So they've lost their jobs and they're struggling. They might have medical bills now. Um, then closer to home, obviously, we've, we've seen everything in the news about Boohoo um, and, and the issues in Leicester, which it, it was kind of already known to those issues, but it's really taken the pandemic for that to really gain a lot more media attention and, um, and everyone's quite focused on what's happening. Yeah. There. yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And the fact that they are, they're, you know, um, creating their model factory, what, what's your thoughts around that in terms um, of... Uh, I think the business model really needs looking at and addressing. I know they've said that they'll um, invest in their supply chain and pledge you know, um, £10 million, but that's a bit meaningless if, if you aren't going to address your, your purchasing practices, your model, if you're going to keep putting um, supplies under pressure. Like, is, is that the, the factory that they're going to have? I mean, it's going to be interesting to see um, what happens. I mean, you can have a model factory and you can show you know how to do something but is that really sustainable is their whole business model sustainable in terms of can they if, does it have longevity without exploiting workers and can they continue to to sell at cheap prices because you, you can have obviously large volumes and you can get economies of scale and you can definitely take mar uh, margin hits but you can't do that on everything um, and I know, I know that's why they are being you know questioned about how they can still go on like that yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to sort of uh, responsibilities around sort of the brands and the retailers and then governments. But I really wanted to touch on the research that you recently did. Um, so in your paper, and I would urge, um, we'll put a link up to it, actually, because I'll urge anyone to read it. It's really insightful um, and very digestible as well, which is good in terms of the way it's been written. Um, but you recently published a paper looking at detecting and remediating modern slavery in the fashion chain. Um, 
And just tell us a little bit about, I guess, the process, because that leads us on to talk a little bit about collaboration, because, um, yeah, the way you approached it was quite undercover cop uh, almost, but um, it got some great results that you probably wouldn't have been had access to um, otherwise. So maybe just talk us a little bit through that. Um, okay, so um, yes, yeah, so this paper came out just at the end of July. So I did um, a, a big project with a company, um, a multi-billion company that's a fashion and sportswear brands. Well, they have a number of brands. And um, they were really looking at how to respond to the modern slavery legislation and how to investigate modern slavery. So we were looking at kind of where the risk was within their supply chain. And um, we went to Southeast Asia. We went to a factory that they had a really good um, relationship with, long-term partnerships. That there was a good factory that that passed a, a normal standard audit, but they had a high pr proportion of migrant labourers. And migrant labour is really high risk when it comes to modern slavery because people are moving from one country to another in the hope of a better life. They could be trafficked. They could be paying really high recruitment fees to get from one country to another um so we really wanted to see how we could investigate it and there is a lot of criticism about audits um you know i, I know from personal experience when i've wanted to place orders with factories for different retailers and each retailer has their supplier code of conduct and then they audit against this code um and each one has a slightly different code of conduct and they want their own audit so factories do get a bit bored of this and it, it, it's kind of the, the term is audit fatigue where they get tired of, of, of this relentless um auditing um so we we acknowledged that there were issues with auditing but we needed to start somewhere we needed to, to investigate and see what was going on um but rather than a standard audit so that will look within the four walls of a factory it will look at the the working conditions like health and real really quite health and safety focused we wanted to expand the scope and look outside of the, the four walls of the factory. We wanted to look at the end-to-end the -end recruitment process. So how were these workers getting into the factory? Um, and it was a really deep dive investigation. We worked with an, an NGO, which were, you know, it was fantastic to work with them. We, we, we acknowledge in the paper how important it was to collaborate with, with experts that had done this before um, and knew a lot of local information as well, which was needed. We also collaborated with another buyer that um, worked in the factory to have that leverage. Um, and yeah, we had this like triangulation process where we, we interviewed the workers, we interviewed the management, we really looked through all the documents. Um, and the main issue was that, that you know, there, was, there were indicators of modern slavery because there were issues with policy and procedure um, and just speaking to the workers as well. And, and and being quite different from a standard audit because you were a bit like a detective you're trying to work out how did they get into the country who had they yeah. spoken to had they you know had they got their passports um the real issue how, um, just to say how, how easy was it for them to, to talk to you were they quite open in terms of what was really going on because sometimes you know they've been rehearsed or they've been asked to say certain things I mean, as, as far as we were aware, we had the NGO to kind of to help us with this. And they believed that the workers weren't um, being coached. And I suppose you can never be fully certain, but they were very open. Because um, I think the main issue was that the workers don't necessarily know when they're being exploited. And that is a real issue. And that's why we say in the paper that a worker-focused worker approach is really needed um, so that the workers have a voice, because that's the only way you really truly find out what's happening within their environment so you know doing a, an audit like we did a, what we call a targeted audit it was very resource intensive took a lot longer than normal audit. so it's not going to be a case of you do you know every retailer should do this within every factory in their supply chain that's not the case but we feel that it's important to at least do it once and really find out risk because the company I was working with from doing this audit really started to understand where the risks were in their supply chains. So it could really help to inform policy, train their workers, and then move to a more developmental approach. The supplier became more involved in, in developing the, the, the policy because they're the one that's manufacturing and, and then we could really get the workers involved as well. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, really, really important in terms of that collaboration and, uh, like you say, informing policy because it's about helping to change. So it wasn't, it wouldn't be something that company you could roll out on a uh, a scale this targeted audit, but it was more of a um, helping to inform, as you say, policy. Was that more the? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then just talking a little bit, so you mentioned a little bit about the Modern Day Slavery Act. So um, just in terms of responsibility and government. So, you know, in 2015, obviously, the government leaders, they agreed to the SDG goals. But, um, you know, we've not seen much, I guess, um, what can we say, we've not seen much traction or progress. or It's been very marginal in terms of um, the progress we've seen. So we've seen Modern Day Slavery Act, we've seen obviously um, a, recent, a recent initiative such as the Apparel and General Merchandise, <coughs> excuse me, Public Private Protocol, it's a mouthful. Um, what are your views on this and what else do you think needs to be done or can be done in, from a government perspective, but also from a brand's perspective? I mean, the, the Public Private Protocol, I think you know, it's a good initiative because it's a multi-stakeholder initiative. There's the um, unions involved, trade associations, government enforcement bodies. Um, and it does need government enforcement because it's such a complex issue. Retailers can't tackle modern slavery on their own. Um, it needs multiple stakeholders com coming together. You know, if you think about what's happening in the UK, you've got tax evasion, benefit fraud, health and safety issues. Um, so the government really needs to take steps in t you know, investigating this further. Um, but at the same time, like I mentioned earlier, the retailers need to mm -hmm. acknowledge their responsibility and be accountable. Um, look at their own models as well, looking at their purchasing practices, because you know you, you can't be looking at social sustainability but then also putting um, suppliers under so much pressure as well. Something's got to give, and the workers are often those that that suffer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then. Um... I guess in terms of um, any other initiatives that maybe we should be aware of that come through or has been quite um, not revolutionary, but just pushing change. Um, I mean, I've, I've had another paper um, published that was looking at collaboration. Um, so there are a number um, of initiatives as the ACT um, Practices Initiative that's looking at um, how you can create more of a level playing field and how retailers can almost have the same kind of awareness of what the, what pressure they're putting suppliers under. I mean, there is definitely collaboration going on. You've got the um, the ETI, the Ethical um, Trading Initiative, that, um, you know, really encourages collaboration mm -hmm. amongst their, um, their members and they have a number of different working groups that they, they look at specific issues. Um, but collaboration really is key because... You know, no retailer can can tackle issues alone, um, and they can share resources, they can share expertise. It can definitely help with cost um, when they work together. But I mean, it's not easy. You need you need trust, you need um, commitments, you need to have that same mindset, and you really need to decouple your kind of sustainability agenda from your commercial agenda. But from the retailers and brands that I've worked with, you know, they have been very willing to collaborate. You can see the the usefulness of doing so. Yeah, yeah, I really, uh, collaboration, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, collaboration is fundamental, so we all talk about, you know, it's the responsibility of the government, it's the responsibility of the brands, it's the responsibility of the consumer, but in actual fact, we all have to take some responsibility, um, which brings us nicely into the, the consumer and their, the part that they play, really, so, um, you know, we talk about societal change and it's needed at every level. So we know in terms of consumer demand, um, how that can influence production changes. And the whole conversation that we're still having in terms of um, action, intention versus action. So consumers intend to do well, but in, that, in terms of what they actually are doing, there's a, there's a gap. So um, what is it that you think that maybe consumers can do uh, that can help drive change? I mean, I think you touched on it earlier as well, that the environment seems to be, a, you know, I think it's more tangible. So people, I think people are coming around more that they're beginning to understand about workers and, you know, there's someone that made your clothes. Um, you know, there's documentaries on TV and you see pollution and you see, you know, 
the oceans and, and different um, environmental issues and, and you don't often relate people to your clothes. I think the pandemic has, um, has helped in some respects because it's been in the media and people can see some of the issues and question brands. Um, I know there's a lot of campaigns at the moment that are kind of naming and shaming those brands that have cancelled orders and um, are, are not supporting the workers. So I think, I mean, from a consumer myself, no, no one's perfect, but you can definitely um, be a lot more inquisitive and and really think about where where are you buying your clothes from and do you really support the brands and, um, and you know, do your values align with theirs, for example? Um, you know, can you maybe support local, support a smaller company and, and maybe mm -hmm. pay a little bit more, but, you know, you get one item rather than a, a few items, but maybe you'll, you'll, you'll you know, keep that longer um, and really buy things that you really, you really love and that you're not just going to wear once and, and throw away. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really small brands. I think it is becoming more common to find some really um, great brands out there that are doing a lot. And I think, it, you know, I've, I've bought things recently from Orange, Origin Africa, for example, a not-for-profit. Not for um, and you get a nice handwritten note with the item and, and information about how that's supporting the workers. And maybe you want to support those brands more that you can really see that are being transparent. Yeah. And I guess, um, you know, we talk about sort of the, the consumer and the more that they move towards those more purpose led or, you know, um, conscious brands, then the more um, uh, accessible in terms of price point would be because there is a bit of a conversation in terms of at the current some of those brands are, you know, priced a little bit more, but there's a reason for that. There's a story behind that. So, um, so yeah, do you think that the more consumers walk with their feet towards these brands, the more they'll, they'll be more accessible? Yeah, definitely. Because I think, you know, prices, like you said, you are paying a bit more, um, particularly, you know, certain, I mean, we're switching a bit more to the environment side, but, you know, more environmentally friendly materials will become cheaper if more, you know, companies buy them, for example. Um, or, but maybe people just need to understand more, you know, the the cost of their garment, and because there is a person involved making it, and and really understand why you need to pay um, a higher price, um, and just do more research, really, because there is a lot more available now with the modern slavery legislation, for example. You can go on companies' websites and you can see the kinds of initiatives that they're doing. Um, so there is a lot more information out there to, to really find out, you know, about the brands that you are buying from. Perfect. Um, I do want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. So maybe um, what would your, you know, I'm just thinking to all, you know, with my thoughts in terms of brands and I, you know, often want to just to tell retailers and brands and consumers, not consumers, but retailers and brands really to, you know, make the, make the confession and just commit to doing good or commit to change. So um, what would your message to the retailers and brands be? Um, and maybe also what would be your key takeaway for our listeners as consumers? I mean, I think brands and retailers, they need to be a lot more accountable and, and transparent. And, and they need to investigate what's going on with it within their supply chain. You can no longer say, oh, we didn't know that was being made there or that was subcontracted. You know, I know it's complex and I know it's difficult, but you do have to start somewhere and you do have to, to take ownership and you have to investigate. If you don't start to look what's going on, then you can't improve it. So you yeah. might as well, you know, you need to discover these issues to make changes and you need to be quite bold and, and see what is going on and then find out, you know, how are you going to remediate those? What policies need to be changed? Make sure that you're looking internally as well and, and people within your organisation that, are working with the factories, the designers, the buyers that are visiting, make sure they understand some of the, the requests they're making and, and the knock-on effect they can have as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I suppose the key takeaways would be quite similar, really, um, from both a, a concept, we've obviously just touched on some of the things we can all do with consumers, um, but companies need to be a lot more accountable and responsible and we could potentially see a lot of change after this pandemic. So it's kind of really seeing that through. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to know, I mean, it's a journey, isn't it? It's a journey that's, uh, it's probably not going to be solved over the next year or maybe even two years, but it's a journey and every little step towards that goal is, um, 
is key. Yeah, definitely. And the more people that, you know, the more companies and the more people that make that change, it's going to, you know, create that step change. Yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the questions that's been coming through. And um, hang on, two seconds. So I've got a question comes in, and I think you've touched on this already, actually, but um, what more needs to be done by brands, manufacturing, and specifically in the UK? Um, so, yeah, you need lots of the, the brands and retailers, particularly in the UK, because the UK, it's got such potential, such amazing factories. Um, the pandemic has shown their capabilities and their, their quick response to making PPE, for example. Um, but then it's also shone light on some of the, the, the unscrupulous suppliers and some of the issues that are going on. Um, but we need more retailers and brands to start sourcing in the UK. I know it's, it, it's that kind of catch-22 because they're nervous because there's issues and the reputational risk. But if more people come back and start sourcing from the UK, then it's going to create that volume. It's going, and if more and more retailers actually have good practice, then you know that will create that change that's needed. Um, and the, the, the suppliers need consistency. And if they have consistent volumes and consistent orders then their costs will go down as well so that's what i think that's really what's needed um in the uk okay great um and then we have another question um around mentioned the modern slavery act so um so I'm just gonna this one. do you agree with pretty patel's assessment that the modern slavery act is not fit for purpose I mean, I think there's definitely weaknesses with the Act um, mm -hmm. because it's not clear, like, who should be reporting and you can get away with saying that you're not doing very much. Um, but I do think you need to start somewhere. And I think from, you know, my research, because of that legislation, it really encouraged companies to start looking within their supply chains. And CSR teams, you know, it almost put them on the map more because they're, the directors have to sign the statements. It gave them, um, you know, they were more interested about what was going on and encouraging um, CSR teams to start investigating and looking at how um, one slavery could be you know, tackled within the supply chain. So, you know, it's definitely not perfect and a lot more needs to be done um, mm -hmm. to make it a lot more stringent and um, whether that's like, I don't know, fines or there's so many different ideas that I know it's being um, looked at how it can be developed further um but i really do think you need to start somewhere and and it, it is going to need more government enforcement to make those required changes yeah well, yeah no absolutely i think government enforcement you're totally right is you know it's imperative um okay so our next question coming through says uh besides companies do you think uh consumers care about sustainability Sorry, in fashion um, and what role can consumers play in all of this so again you probably touched on elements of this but um, around the do you think consumers really care about sustainability I think it's definitely changing and that you, the younger generation as well are becoming a lot more aware and, and even the places they want to work they want to work for someone that's a lot more responsible there's definitely still that attitude behavior gap because you can say that you yeah you care and then you'll see something cheap and, and think it's a bargain and, and carry on buying from a company that's maybe not the most ethical. Um, so, I mean, we've touched on, haven't we, how, what, what consumers can do, but um, wow. I think we, we all probably need to change. No one's perfect. That's it. It's, um, you know, I heard uh, it said consumption is a, um, it's a, an addiction. So, you know, it takes time for us to, to take, to come out of what we're used to doing and to doing something else. So yeah, it's gonna, it, it'll, it'll take time. Um, oh, a nice question here. So do you encourage more qualitative or quantitative studies in the area of sustainable fashion with regards to the consumer perspective? Um, to be honest, I don't really focus on the consumer perspective. A lot of my, my research focuses more on the supply chain side and I am a qualitative researcher. Um, but I mean, I think with something quite complex like sustainability, and if we are thinking about consumers, for example, there's, there's a story and, uh, the, you know, quantitative research is important as well. Um, I think there's, 
there's definitely merits of, of both quantitative and qualitative research but if you are when you um, are doing qualitative research and you're speaking to people and you're maybe interviewing them for example they can really elaborate on, on points that maybe you wouldn't necessarily you'd maybe potentially get quite closed answers with a survey for example and you might need to delve a little bit more um, into detail so yeah I, I mean there's definitely scope for doing qualitative studies yeah yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm a, I'm a bit of a qual girl as well. Let's find out the reason why. Let's dig deep. <laughs> so, um, oh, let's look into the future a bit. So what does fashion look like in 2030? And then um, another question, another person's just asked, how do we follow your work? Um, okay, so I'll do the first one. What should fashion look like in 2030? I think it's quite difficult to look that far ahead because I think we, we never anticipated 2020 to be like this right, right. Um, so like now it's really quite yeah quite strange to think how could things develop um I mean we, we've almost said that because of the pandemic we could reset the industry um mm -hmm. and I spoke about this quite a lot with my um students on our, our business ethics course and during um you know, during the first part of the pandemic we saw that consumer habits were changing and there's um, you know, secondhand Depop sales have gone up, for example, and people are getting into craft and mending. But then you saw like the queues when the shops reopened. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, and I know some of my students said that they were really skeptical when I said, you know, "Could we? Do you think this will be like the the start of something new?" So, I think time will tell. I mean, technology mm -hmm. as well has probably got a big um, part to play as well. Whether um, that can improve. Um, the industry improve the, the social side make it more transparent um and i think we need to see more accountability and more responsible um companies really changing their business models which is quite hard to do because if you have to retrofit um some you know an old business model that's really quite because there's that real power imbalance as well and i think we need over the next you know 10 years if we're talking 2030 see that that power shift as well because there's two you know the, the buyers are powerful and we've seen that from the pandemic the fact that they're they're getting away with just cancelling orders and then the, yeah. the less powerful suppliers and workers suffer yeah and i guess also in terms of that um you know the incentives within the the uh the the, the process the supply chain process those incentives where they are that almost encourages uh, modern slavery to some extent as well yeah i guess um the second part of the question was it following on from how do you follow your work yes <laughs> um, i mean a lot more needs to be done particularly within academia in terms of uh, modern slavery research it's quite new um so i think it, there's a big piece on, on worker voice and, and really seeing how um the, the the model can be changed in terms of moving away from the buyers being quite paternalistic and powerful and, and making sure that um, the suppliers are involved in, in policy and and the workers are involved as well um, and seeing how, how do we investigate modern slavery because you need to start somewhere and you can do a deep dive um, risk assessment but how do you make that more scalable and it, and it probably is from a more worker-faced approach, focused approach um, and maybe also learning from other industries because um, I've focused a lot on the fashion industry but it's, you know, modern slavery is not just in the fashion industry, although it is one of the largest perpetrators, so learning from other industries as well could be quite useful. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. And then we're going to another consumer uh, perspective question. So from a consumer perspective, do you think there's a country or a market that has started to change their buying behaviour in their mainstream markets? So... Yeah. Is there a country or market that's already started to move more towards, uh, I get that, more responsible purchasing behaviour? Um, so I mean, there's definitely, within the UK, there's definitely more and more sustainable brands. And I think they, um, they're becoming more more fashionable as well, because people are still going to want to to buy, um, you know, fashion products. We, we love fashion. So um, I think the UK has got real potential. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's happening yet, I don't think it fully is. But like I said, there's there's an amazing potential for reshoring and production that was once offshore coming back to the UK. We've got the capabilities. Um, 
to some extent you know we, we definitely need to kind of um improve the the industry and make production attractive so that more young people want to start working in the industry but um so yeah i would say i mean there's, there's pockets aren't there? there's brands in america there's i think that the real answer is probably local so each 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 country has these local um, more sustainable companies so maybe to try and support your uh local sustainable brands yeah yeah okay great and then i think we have time for one more so um oh can you name some theories which are relevant to the area of studying sustainable fashion um I yeah, I think it really depends on which area you, you're studying and um, so when I was studying collaboration, I was just good, um, using relational theory, for example. Um, institutional theories use quite a lot, stakeholder theory. I think it really depends on you know, what you're looking at and are you looking at suppliers, are you looking at relationships? Um, so I suppose it's a case of just looking at other papers that are out there and seeing what theories are being used and whether they can be further developed. Right, yeah, yeah. And then just going back to your NGO, do you think that NGOs can get more involved in the auditing process? Is that something that you would recommend? Yeah, definitely. So in my paper, we talk about um, the remediation and um, moving away from, well, moving towards a, a developmental approach. And, and so we actually, um, the company I was working with had um, a local NGO on the ground and that's definitely a, a really good approach to move to so they the local NGO worked with the the workers they had a, a smartphone app so they could report any issues and, and they also got educated more on their rights mm -hmm. through the app and they worked with the supplier and they tried to solve issues together without informing the buyer um, so it, it takes the buyer out so that everyone's a lot more open and not worried about any repercussions mm -hmm. um, so definitely in, in NGOs, the ones that, that are there, they know what's happening because often, you know, the buyers are, are in a different country and there's that that disconnect there. So the NGOs have a huge part to play in, and they were so useful in um, the research that I've done because they were able to, to really have, well, they can have impartiality, but they can also, um, you know, share their, their knowledge and their expertise. There are obviously some NGOs that are focused on the fashion industry, but there's some that are working in many other industries as well. So they can they can inform you and, and help share their expertise from other industries as well. Right, wonderful, thank you. And I think that was our yep yeah, our final question. Um, Wow, I think we could carry on. I think we might need a part two because there's so much more to go on and discuss and it's developing, you know, as we, as, uh, you know, the time goes on as well. So, um, so thank you so much, um, Amy. It's been really great speaking with you. Um, <laughs> we'll wait for part two. Uh, and thank you so much for some great questions that came through there. Really opened, um, you know, opened our eyes up to some areas that potentially, you know, goes amiss. Um, so, Thank you for tuning in. Our next Wednesday Wisdom will be on the 19th of August, where we'll have another fabulous guest. Um, so do please join us and, um, yeah, have a lovely evening. So thank you again, everybody. Thank Bye you. for now. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Bye. Bye.